Um, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Jaume Gonzalez. Uh, can I just please quickly check if you can hear me? Okay, if you can make a, maybe make a sign or thumbs up. Okay, perfect. So, um, as I was saying, uh, my name is Jaume Gonzalez. I'm the business lead for referentials. Uh, so, thank you very much for your for your interest and your attendance. Uh, I'll just quickly show you show you the agenda for today. So I'll start with, uh, with an introduction to RMS. So I'll explain what RMS is. Um, I will describe the operating model for RMS. I will give you an introduction to, to the SPO portal and I will show you the, the structure of lists and terms within RMS. Um, I will then give you an overview on the functionalities that RMS offers. Um, I will then explain who are the list owners of RMS. I will describe some of the RMS business particulars. I will then move to the second part of the presentation, which is actually um, an explanation in detail of the change request process. And I will end up with some um, key messages. So moving to the first part of the, of the presentation. So um, what is RMS? So RMS is essentially a dictionary of controlled vocabularies or lists. And one of the main objectives of RMS is to implement ISO IDMP 11239 and 11240 standards, which are basically standards that have to do with standard terms and units of measurement. RMS contains, as of today, 147 lists, and this number is growing. And these come from, uh, these belong to uh, different maintenance organizations, such as uh, dosage forms and root of administration from EDQM. We have ATC human and ATC vets from WHO. We have med release from MSSO, etc. cetera. Um, it also contains internally managed lists, such as the target species list, the age range list, and the, and the vet list. So RMS replaces uh, the old EUTCT system and is a single source of referential data to be used to support regulatory processes across the EU in a centralized way. So for your information, RMS went live in June 2017 and it provides backward compatible API that mimics the behavior of EUDCT. Now, concerning the target operating model of RMS, the RMS services include data content. Uh, they include new processes, improved functionalities as compared to EUTCT, and it also includes a team of data stewards. So um, in particular, RMS is the central repository and provider of referential master data. There is a web, a SPOR web portal and an application programming interface also known as API, through which data can be accessed. There is a new process to, re to register and update referential data. And the model includes a team of EMA data stewards to manage data using consistent data quality rules, and also are there to provide support to stakeholders. I would like to remind everyone that RMS is already being used by several systems such as the electronic application form, Siamet, IRIS. Uh, there's also other systems such as the PS PSUR repository and UDRA GMDP. And therefore, this means that RMS data is already being used today in regulatory submissions. In addition, the use of RMS is planned to be extended to other projects and systems such as PMS, UPD, EVVET3, uh, the new clinical trials portal, and Article 57. Now, how does RMS operate? So, in the central part of the picture, uh, you can see RMS that acts as the central repository and provider of referential, of referential master data. As mentioned earlier, this data is accessible through the RMS portal and also programmatically through the API. And there is a team of data stewards that provide support to the stakeholders. 
to the right side of the screen, you then have the external maintenance organizations and data owners, such as EDQM or WHO, just to name a few, from which RMS consumes data. And in the left part of the screen, we have the users and consuming systems. And this can be from either industry or this can be NCAs or EMA staff. And they can consume data for either regulatory activities or for business processes. And they can also submit change requests to EMA. Now, I'd like to show you what the RMS web portal looks like. So on the top screenshot, you can see this view is the list of lists view. So in every row, you can see a different, uh, a different list with all its relevant attributes. Now, if we click on the triangle next to the list ID, uh, we can see the list metadata. And this is the screenshot on the bottom of your screens. So here in the list metadata, you can see data such as domain, creation date, modified date, version, etc. If we click on a, on a list from the list view that I showed earlier, we'll see the terms within that list, as you can see on the top screenshot. Uh, if we now click on one of the terms from the, uh, from the term list, we'll drill down to the term details. And this is what you can see on the bottom part of the slide. So this specifically is the collapsed view, which will only show by default some of the fields. But if you click on the show all, hide all button, uh, you will see more details as well as uh, the term metadata as shown in the next two slides. So here in the first slide, uh, We've clicked on the show all, uh, hide all button, and we can see the term metadata as well as additional content that was hidden in the collapsed view, and uh, such as the operational attributes, dates of modification of data, etc. This is also part of the term details view, and in this example, we can see mapping details to to other consuming systems as well as extended attributes. In terms, of, uh, in terms of list types in RMS, RMS has flat lists, such as the species list that you can see in the, in the first screenshot. And here you can see that there are no, no hierarchical levels. Uh, but RMS also has lists with hierarchy. So as an example, on the second screenshot, you can see the VEDRA list. So in this, screen, in this screenshot, you can see that all terms belong to the same SOC level. But if I click on one of the triangles next to the term ID, and you can see uh, these indicated in red to the left of your screens, I can then drill down into lower levels. So in this slide, you can see in red all of the different sub levels or child terms under the, uh, under the SOC cardiovascular system disorders. So this is a good example of a hierarchical list in RMS. Now, each term in RMS will have common attributes such as term name, term ID, description, domain, etc. And as the name suggests, these attributes are common to all terms in RMS. And in addition to those, each term may have extended attributes, which will be specific to the list to which they belong. So again, as an example here, in the bottom part of the, of the slide, you can see the extended attributes uh, that are specific to the target species list. Now, I'd like to raise your attention to the fact that each list in RMS should contain a document that is called list information document. You can open this document from the actions column in the, in the list view by clicking on the document icon that you can see in the red circle. And when you open it, you will see something similar to the screenshot at the bottom of the screen. So in this list information document, 
you will find useful information on the list, such as a description, an explanation on the main users for the list, who the list owner is, as well as information on the list hierarchy, extended attributes, change request process. So you can see a comprehensive list of all of the sections of this document in the boxes that you can see in the slide. I will not go in detail for this one as there is extensive um, information on the, on the RMS functionalities in the RMS web user manual. But this is just a reminder of the functionalities that are available in RMS. So users can perform simple searches, advanced searches, or they can even save complex searches. They can browse the RMS content and I've just shown you the different views that we have in RMS. RMS also allows users to export either full lists or selected terms or translations. And this, by the way, can be done in either CSV or XML format. Users can search, view, edit, or delete change requests. And of course, they can submit change requests to either create, update, or delete terms, or also to create or update lists. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, there will be a dedicated uh, part on, on, the, on change requests. So I won't cover this further at this point, but this will be covered in, in further detail later. We then have the tag functionality, which is to create groupings of terms, either within a list or across several lists. And this is for quick reference and for, uh, uh, for time efficiency for users. RMS also allows for the creation and management of subscriptions. And this is to receive email notifications of either major or minor changes within, within the list selected by the user. Users can also search or view translations or even provide translations either online or offline, and this is via bulk upload. But an important message here is that this functionality uh, is restricted to NCA users only. So I will repeat this again later, but I'd like to make this clear now. And then last but not, but not least, RMS also has a functionality to store RMS related documentation. And for this, the RMS portal contains tabs for general as well as technical documentation. As mentioned earlier, RMS currently has 147 lists and these belong to different maintenance organizations. So in particular, 16 lists are owned by EDQM and examples of these are the pharmaceutical dogs form, combined terms, routes and methods of administration, etc. EMA is the list owner for 127 lists. And these are typically lists that were migrated from EUTCT, such as the age range list, application legal basis, target species, etc. But it also contains uh, lists that are required for other EMA projects or systems such as OMS, PMS, EVVET3, uh, clinical trials portal, etc. RMS also has lists owned by other organizations. And examples of these are the language list, which is owned by ISO, the MEDRA list by MSSO, and the ATC human and vet lists, uh, whose owner is WHO. Now, in terms of business processes, EMA can process and validate all change requests received and can create provisional terms triggered by all of these change requests. As a subsequent step, EMA can approve change requests for any EMA owned lists. And in the case of externally managed lists, EMA will liaise with the relevant list owners of those lists to make sure that the change request is, uh, is completed and finalized. As mentioned earlier, the list information document will show details on the list owner, 
on how to apply for change requests, what are the list attributes, etc. And also, as mentioned earlier uh, in a previous slide, the list of lists view in RMS will show who the list owner is. And you can see this highlighted in yellow in the, in the screenshot at the bottom of your screens. This slide shows the functionalities that are available to NCAs according to RMS list owners. However, given the, the scope of this meeting, I will leave this slide in for your reference, but I will not go in detail. Uh, and I will rather focus on them in the next slide, which is more relevant for industry users. So in this slide, we can see the permissions matrix for industry users according to RMS list owners. So what is this telling us? So industry users can download any lists owned by EMA, as well as EDQM, EDQM lists and units of measurement lists, as long as the user is logged in. Regarding um, WHO lists, so ATC human and ATC vet, ATC vet lists, as well as the Medra list, these can be browsed in RMS, but they cannot be downloaded. Why is this? This is for copyright reasons. And so in this case, if the, if the, um, if the user requires the full list or a full download of the list, then the list owner should be contacted for this purpose. In terms of change requests, um, industry users can submit change requests through RMS for all EMA owned lists, as well as for uh, change requests um, that concern the EDQM and the units of measurement list. For ATC codes, requests should be submitted directly to WHO. However, and since the ATC lists are only published, updated and published by WHO once a year, if the user needs uh, an ATC code to be published in RMS before the official publication by WHO, a change request can be sent to RMS and following relevant validation, the ATC code can be published on demand in the RMS portal, as we have an agreement for, for this with WHO. I hope this was understood. If not, I will make a pause in, in a few minutes so we can, we can take it if there was, this wasn't clear. Now, regarding, uh, yeah, regarding MEDRA codes, any requests should be sent directly to MSSO. And last part of the table, translations. So as mentioned earlier, these are reserved to NCA users. So industry users are not expected to submit any translations through RMS. Okay, so this is the end of the first part. The second part is uh, about the change request process. So there's a clearly established process in place since RMS implementation by which any users who require a new or an updated referential for a, for a regulatory application, they have to request the pre-registration of that referential in RMS so that it then appears in the relevant consuming system, be it EAF or any other systems. So users can request changes or additions to referential data via the RMS portal. And in particular, they can ask for the creation of new lists or terms, the update of existing lists or terms, or the deletion of terms. I will give you an overview on how a change request is submitted, but you can also find detailed step-by-step -step instructions on how to do this in the RMS web user manual, and you can see the link to it in the slide. Also, as a reminder, any issues or queries concerning change requests should be raised through the EMA service desk at the URL that you can see on the screen. So there is a dedicated tab in the RMS portal for change requests. You can see it highlighted in yellow in the first screenshot. 
this is the area to manage, browse, search, change requests, and it also contains buttons for sending um, term change requests and list change requests. And you can see these buttons in yellow. If we click on the new term change request, we will see a window similar to the second screenshot. So this is the area for general information and it's where the user needs to provide the type of change request, the justification and the list associated with the term. Contact details should be automatically populated for any registered users who are logged in. And there is also the possibility to submit supporting documentation as an attachment. The next section of the term change request is the term information where details such as the term name, description, domain, parent information, mappings and extended attributes should be specified. As mentioned earlier, the screenshot on top is the area to browse, search and manage change requests. And the second screenshot is an example of a, of a search for change requests and what the results look like. So from this screen, on the bottom of your screens, the user can select the relevant change request and look into the details of those change requests. And this can be achieved by clicking on the magnifying lens icon that you can see on the right column. The process for a term change request will, will typically start um, with the submission of a change request to either add a term, update a term, or delete a term. And this should include supporting documentation. The next phase is the validation phase. And here data stewards will validate all change requests using their knowledge and guidance available. They will be checking at business rules. They will check that the request is appropriate, that it's not a duplicate, etc. SLAs for validation are typically two to five working days. And there are three possible outcomes out of this validation phase. The, S, the, the request may be returned if there are questions or clarifications required from the requester. If the request is considered valid, the term will be published as provisional in the RMS dictionary. And if the change request is not considered satisfactory, it will be invalidated and the reasons for this will appear in the email notification that will be automatically submitted to the user. In case of these agreements, the advice is to raise a ticket through the EMA service desk, and you have the link to that in the previous slide, and the, the change request number should be clearly identified in the ticket. The last phase is the approval phase. And here SLAs will be one to two months for EMA owned lists. In this phase, and if needed or applicable, data stewards will consult with relevant as subject matter experts. If the request is approved, the term will be updated in the RMS dictionary. And I say updated because it means that it will change from provisional to current. And the other scenario is that the request is rejected. And in this case, again, the reasons will be explained in the email notification and any disagreements should be raised through the service desk. So as explained in the previous slide, all RMS requests go through two different steps. The first step is validation. And here data stewards will check for completeness they will check that the right type of request was selected, etc. And the approval phase will be a more in-depth assessment of the request, and there will be consultation with subject matter experts, if applicable. In terms of statuses, when a term passes validation, it's published as provisional. 
if it doesn't pass validation, the term status becomes invalid. And in this case, the term is not published. When provisional terms are approved, their status becomes current. When provisional terms are rejected, their status may become either nullified or non-current, which basically means that the term is being used, but it's not longer recommended. And in this latter case, a current term should be used instead. Now, looking at statuses from the regulatory submission point of view, industry can submit applications to the relevant regulatory authority using either provisional or current terms. And before finalizing the assessment, the regulatory authority should check the term status and should only approve applications which contain terms which are current. This slide is showing the, the flowchart of RMS change requests, and this is from the point of view of an industry user preparing the, applica the electronic application form. So starting from the top left of the screen, the industry user starts preparing the electronic application form. The user then checks if the referential is okay or not in the application form. In the case that the referential is correctly displayed in the application form, the, and this is the path to the far right of the slide, the user can complete the application form and submit it. The competent authority will receive the application form and will be able to process it, and this will be considered as the end of the submission process. Now, moving to the middle part of the slide, um, what happens if the referential is not okay in the application form? Then the industry user, user should log in RMS, and for this, a SPORE industry role is required. And then the user should check if the referential term exists in RMS or not. We have two possibilities here. Uh, to the, uh, the possibility on the right, if the, if the referential exists, in RMS, uh, but it needs an update for whatever reason. For whatever reason, then the industry user should submit an update term change request through the SPO portal, so that the term, so that the referential gets updated. Um, on the other hand, if the referential does not exist in RMS, then an add term change request is required. In both cases, once the request is submitted, the user should wait for the term to be either validated uh, uh, or approved by data stewards. Once the data steward takes action, the request um, takes action on the request, the user will receive a notification. And at this point, uh, the user should check the changes in RMS. I'm now on the left part of the slide. Once the changes are approved in RMS, the data will be automatically pulled into the electronic application form. And at this point, the user can complete the, the filling of the application form. So this is the, the flow chart for um, list change requests. So here the process is similar for as for term change requests, and it will start with the submission of a request to either add a list or update a list, and this should include supporting documentation. Again, the first step is the validation phase. Data stewards here will validate all of the change requests using their knowledge and any guidance available. They will again check for business roles. They will check that the uh, type of request is adequate. They will check that there are no duplicates, data quality, etc. Um, SLAs for validation will be five to 20 working days. Uh, again, three possible outcomes. The request may be returned 
if there are if there are clarifications required from the requester. If the request is considered acceptable, the request will be valid and the list preparation will start, but nothing will be, be will be published at this point. So we're not creating any provisional list. It only gets published when it's finally approved. And the request may also be invalidated. And in this case, again, the reasons for this would be contained in the notification to the user. Again, this agreement should be raised through the um, uh, through the EMA service desk and the change request number should be identified in the ticket. SLAs for, appro um, SLAs for approval for EMA owned lists may take up to six months and factors that are important here are the size of the list, the complexity of it, and whether consultation with subject, subject matter experts is required or, or not. If the request is approved, the list will be either created or updated, depending on the, on the scenario. And if it is rejected, again, the reasons will be in the notification and these agreements should be tackled through a ticket uh, through the service desk. So service level agreements are published in, in the SPOR SLA document that is in the RMS portal in the URL that you can see on your screens. So this obviously has uh, details on SLAs and this is for um, all, of the, all of the SPOR domains and, and, and EMA service desk tickets, etc. Now, just as a reminder, uh, regarding validation and registration of new provisional terms. This may take two to five working days. And for the approval and registration of new current terms, this may take a maximum of two months. This is for EMA managed lists. Some requests may require consultation with different stakeholders, such as EMA scientific committees, WHO, EDQM, just to name a few. And as mentioned, this can have an impact on the resolution time. And then of course, for externally managed lists, SLA should be checked with the external maintenance organization as we are not the owners for those lists. So SLAs for the validation of a new list may take five to 10 working days or 15 to 20 working days in the case of validation of updated list. Uh, for the approval and public publication of new or updated lists, this can take a maximum of six months for EMA managed lists. And as mentioned, this may require consultation with subject matter experts, which can have uh, an impact on the, on the conclusion time. And again, SLAs for externally managed lists to be checked with the external maintenance organizations. So I'm reaching the end here. Important messages to remember are the fact that RMS is already live since 2017 and ready to be used by whoever users and consuming systems. And RMS is already being used in systems such as EAF, Siamet and IRIS, which means that referential data is already being used in regulatory submissions. More information on SPOR can be found on the EMA external website, and you have the link in the slide. Also in the document section of the SPOR portal, there is also information shared with the SPOR change liaisons network, and these include um, stakeholders from both NCAs and industry. And last but not least, questions and queries can be submitted through the EMA service desk to the attention of the, of the SPOR team. And just as a reminder, uh, where can we have, where can we find more documentation or help on SPOR? Uh, five sources. The first one is the SPOR portal. Uh, it contains a document section with loads of useful documentation, 
such as the RMS and the OMS web user manual, the SPORE user registration manual, etc. The second source are the RMS and OMS training videos, which are available on the EMA Info YouTube channel. The third source is the EMA external website, which also contains SPORE-related information documentation. We have also included uh, the link to the account management portal, which is required to request access to SPORE. And last but not least, there is also the link to the EMA service desk portal, which should be used for service requests, issues and requests for technical support. So I think this is the end of the presentation, uh, of the whole presentation actually, so. Then I think that was it, Jami, do you have any further? Um, no, well, I mean, the slides will be distributed and I think in the last slide, if I'm not mistaken, my email is there. So um, more than happy to, to be contacted if there is anything that is not clear, otherwise the EMA service desk tool can be used as well. And yeah, I hope this was a useful um, session for everyone. On, and that's all. Let me know if any questions and, and thank you very much for your interest and for your time. Yes, thank you very much for your interest and for joining us this afternoon and thank you.